Amen. Let's keep going. Amen. Give somebody a high five. Tell them you look great tonight. You look really, really good. You may be seated. Awesome, awesome. What a cool night. Welcome home. Welcome home. It's, it's nice, and, nice and warm in here. So um, not this Sunday, but the next we'll have AC, I promise. Okay? So we're getting them fixed. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, Anyway, let, why don't we do this? I'm gonna, I want to share with you guys uh, a word that is going to sound kind of crazy at first. It's one of those parts in the Bible that you're like, yeah, that's wild. Like, that's, that's insane. But I believe that God wants to do something in us. We're about to step into another level in this church, a whole other level. I promise you the next 70 days, 75 days or so, they're going to change your life. They're going to completely transform you. This ministry, this church, is not built around a church service. It's not built around a Sunday service. This is not a let's experience something good, go home and be the same. This is a church of disciple makers. Amen. A church of people that want to be like Jesus, that want to walk like Jesus. Amen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray right now that the Lord would change our hearts, that he would transform us. To be more like him, not just like him more, not only like him more, but to be more like him. Amen. We're going to pray right now that God would change our hearts, that he would give us pain for what hurts him, that we would have joy for what he rejoices with. Amen. That we would love what he loves and that we would hate what he hates, which is sin. Amen. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. We ask you, Holy Spirit of God, that you would move in our hearts, move in our minds tonight. God, would you take this moment, take this attention that we have, and take it all for yourself. God, we declare right now that our attention is yours. God, we are looking to you. We want you to do something, something amazing in us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your word. We know that this is yours, God. We know that the Bible is not just another book. It's not just a good idea. It is God's idea for us. We know that that is your word. Infallible, God. We know that your word endures forever. That heaven and earth will pass, but your word shall never pass. God, we stand on your promises. We stand on your promises. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's do this, guys. Open up the Bible to 2 Kings chapter 6. Verse 24 through 29. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24 through 29. As you find out part of the Bible, I want to tell you that God has no grandkids. God only has children. He only has sons and daughters. That you are not a child of God because your mama or your daddy are children of God. You each make a decision to follow Christ. You each make a decision to receive the sonship. Of adoption but the Bible talks about God has no grandchildren to me that's such an amazing thing because many people think that they will have a relationship with God because their mom loves Jesus or because their grandpa loves Jesus or because they have a leader who loves them or because maybe they've been to church for a long time I have great news for you today that God doesn't want a long-distance relationship he doesn't want to be your, huh, how do you call that when your family, it's your distant family? Is that what it's called? What is it? Extended family. He doesn't want to be just extended family. Oh, yeah, he's in the family somewhere. He's like that weird uncle we don't talk about. No, no, no. God is your dad. He loves you so much. Bible says even if your father and mother abandon you, I will never leave you. Amen. Amen. Remember that because it's going to be key as we go through this part of the scripture. Second Kings chapter 6. 24, 29. I'm going to read to you all the way through 29. And pay attention because it's wild. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, meaning there was such hunger. There was such a recession. And indeed, they besieged it 
until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cob, meaning one-fourth of, uh, of poop, of daub, droppings, right? One-fourth for, for five shekels. A cob is a cup. So a fourth of a cup of poop from a bird, from a dove, was worth, listen to this, five shekels of silver. Then as the king of, that's, that's real inflation right there. That, that's high gas prices. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my lord, O king. And he said, if the lord doesn't help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Meaning, I got nothing to offer you, lady. Yes, I'm the king, but I'm as broke as you are right now. We're in the same city, in the same situation. I got nothing for you. This lady's asking help for the highest authority in the land, and the land is besieged. The word besieged is something we don't use anymore, but it means surrounded. When the enemy wanted to take over a fortified city, instead of attacking its walls, instead of destroying the city which they eventually wanted to take over, they would just besiege it. They would cut it off. And they would wait for them to come out. And as they would come out, they would kill them one by one. They would cut off all their food supply. They would cut their water supply. They wouldn't allow them to come in and out. Besieging would sometimes allow, lasted years. Not just weeks, not just months, but up to years. Because they had access to all the food, access to everything in the land. They could hunt, they could fish, they could bring in supplies. But the enemy had a good strategy, and it was to besiege, to completely surround, to overwhelm a city. And that is what ha what's happening to this city. And the king says, where can I help you, lady? I got nothing to offer you. We are in such desperate need. Only God can help you. Listen to this. Verse, uh, verse 28. Then the king said to her, what is your trouble? And she answered, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. In this part of the Bible, we see something that is so outrageous. Something so crazy that a mom would give her son so that they would eat the baby, the kid. And as I read this Bible, as I read the scriptures, sometimes I'm, I'm inclined to say, how dare you? How could you do such a thing? I look at my baby, Mateo. He could probably feed the whole church for a week. <laughs> He's a chunky, right? And I'm thinking, I would never, ever, ever kill my own son and boil him and eat him. I would never do such a thing. And as I was saying this to myself in my devotional, the Lord said something to me. Be very careful. Be very careful to say, I would never do such a thing. Because you have never been in that kind of situation. And I began to see something in the story. And I realized that maybe this lady didn't only have one son. Maybe this lady had about 14 mouths to feed. Maybe this lady had already lost her husband. And everyone else was in the same place. Maybe the other lady also had children that were starving. And they themselves were dying. And maybe this kid was already halfway dead. And he had no chance to live. And the other kids, maybe this child, maybe the sacrifice of one would extend the life of the others for at least one week. You see, I don't know what's going on. You say, I still wouldn't do it. But you never crashed a plane in the Andes Mountains as those football players, those rugby players, where they had to eat the body of their teammates. You've never been in a situation, therefore you cannot pass judgment. And even if you were, how dare we pass judgment on someone else's need? You see, as Christians and as believers, we have to learn to withhold our opinion, to get off the seat of judgment, and to allow God to sit on that seat because it only belongs to Him. Because you never know what someone's going through. You will be seeing, as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ, such desperation in people. People that have no hope. People that have never been discipled. Christians that have never been discipled before. And they act in ways becoming of someone who's never been discipled. Sometimes people will walk through these doors, through your house, through your cell group. As the Lord calls you to bless the nations, you will come across people that have done crazy things, wild things, desperate things. And my question to the church is, what is our response? As time goes on and as life goes on, as our nation continues to change, as the gender becomes something that was so simple, it becomes something so 
politically incorrect to even talk about. In a country where when I arrived in this nation, the, the American flag was something you strive for. It's something you look at and you say, I am so proud to be here. It's wild to see that if you put an American flag on a truck, it just immediately seems awkward. To say, God bless America now, it sounds weird. To see people in such need financially, that they begin to do things that they would have never done before. Listen to what I'm about to say. To see people maybe not starving physically, but starving emotionally. I would never give my children, I would never eat my children. But I've seen families devour each other. I've seen families tear each other apart. I've seen brothers and sisters treat each other worse than enemies would. You see, I've seen mothers say some things to their children that it ended up destroying their self-esteem. I've seen also sons and daughters disrespect their families to the point where they say, I wish I would have never been born in this place. Listen to what I'm saying to you. You may not live in a nation or in a time or in a season. 2022 is not the age of cannibalism, perhaps. But it doesn't mean that this nation's not starving. It doesn't mean that the people around us don't need Jesus. It doesn't mean that everything that is happening, everything around us is not like it was here. Please listen. We may not be besieged physically. North Korea hasn't yet reached our borders. Am I making sense? Why am I saying this to you? Because it's so easy to look at stories of the Bible and say, oh, that happened. What a wild thing. But tell me if the enemy hasn't yet surrounded our politics. Tell me if the enemy hasn't surrounded our education system. No, church, are you awake? Tell me if the enemy hasn't yet surrounded the young people in our nation. Where kids are so much more interested in virtual friends and real relationships. Tell me if the enemy hasn't yet surrounded marriages to where people don't believe in the godly, beautiful union between a man and a woman that the Lord designed from the very beginning of creation. Tell me if there's no besieging, not of the church, but of humanity, where right is wrong, where wrong is right. And I know I sound like an old soul, but tell me if this is not biblical. We live in a time and in a place where values have been besieged. And the enemy is just waiting for you to say something, to cancel everything you would speak of that is truthful. We live in a time and we live in an age where anyone who dares to speak the word of God is immediately mocked. I remember watching cartoons. They wouldn't tease the Lord. They wouldn't speak of God. Maybe the Simpsons every once in a while would say a joke. But now it's almost like Christians are the tail end of the joke. Why am I saying this to you? Where the Lord now becomes part of a cuss word. Back in the place, I'm telling you right now that the besieging, that the surrounding of the enemy is still happening. And it's still the same strategy that he uses. Where a man cannot walk down the street without thinking lustful thoughts. And sure, you can blame the women, but man, you've been besieged. Why am I telling you this? Because these are facts of life. Because we could look to the king, to the governor, to the nation's leader and say, please help us. And I would say this, he's in the same boat, Papa. He's in the same boat. So what do we say as believers? Church, what do we say? What answers do we have? How do we respond to this? I am so glad you came to church tonight. Because you and I need to have a response. You and I have the answer. You and I have a solution. You and I have a word of hope in a time of hopelessness. You and I have a king who is higher than the king of the land. Am I making sense? The Lord of Lords, the king of kings. You and I have a source other than theirs. You and I have a different fountain that we drink from. Am I making sense? You and I, you and I are not... I know it's going to sound strange to you. The Bible says that you're not of this world. You're in the world, but you're not of it. You're of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you came to church for the first time, I am so glad you're here. Because you're going to hear something that may just blow your mind away. Here's the problem. The people of the land, including many Christians, including many pastors, including many people who sit in these chairs. I pray that today God, today God changes us. What is our response have you seen some situation so difficult, so tough, so painful, 
Maybe you've seen something that's happening in your own family or your friend is going through something. Or at your work, you see things and you hear things and you don't even know what to say sometimes. Listen, what do we say? The Bible says, it goes on, I'm so glad it didn't stop at verse 29. Aren't you glad that the Bible didn't end right there where children are being eaten by their families? Amen? Aren't you glad that that's not in the book of Revelations, like at the end of the Bible? I know the way the Bible ends, by the way. I know the end of the story, and we win. Amen? Keep going. Let's, uh, let's go. It says here, it says a little bit further. 2 Kings chapter 7 now. It ends chapter 6 and we keep going. Then Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour, fine flour like the good stuff, shall be sold for a shekel. And two sea of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Meaning, remember how much poop used to cost? Well, a cup, a quarter of a cup of poop from a bird, okay, is five times more expensive than what, what you're going to pay for tomorrow for barley and wheat. They're looking at each other as this prophet speaks this word, this word of hope, this word of encouragement, and they laugh at him. And they mock him and they look at him and say, what are you talking about? What reality do you live in? Can't you tell? Are you serious, Elisha? Like, what is your problem? Don't you understand what is happening in our nation? Oh, man, I've heard Christians. I've heard people say, with such, such demise, speak without faith. Speak opinions of others. Church, what do you say when people are going through stuff? Okay, let's, I'm going to go around with the microphone for a while. And I'm going to give you guys scenarios. Just kidding. <laughs> you guys got really nervous. Shut up real quick. But what about your friend that is thinking of getting an abortion? What do you tell her? You just immediately start scrolling through TikTok and see if you could find something good. I mean, what do you say? Do you just think about every book you've read? I mean, what does Joyce Meyer say about this? Oh, no, she didn't talk about it. Or maybe you try to remember everything the pastor said because he might have said something good at some point. I've been going to church for 15 years. Maybe he said one thing. At least one thing might have stuck. But I love Elijah. I love him so much because he doesn't just say stuff. He says, thus says the Lord. This is the word of God. Don't we need to do that? In a time and a place where our opinion, yeah, sure, it may be informed, but it's not the word of God. When everybody else seems to have a reason, a better remark, a more informed opinion because they have another account. Because they watch different news. Because they read a little more. Because they've heard some psychiatrist, some psychologist. Because they have gone to places you haven't gone. Because they have flown to other countries. You see, I know some things because of my mom's brother's cousin's friend's ex-girlfriend works in the government. Everybody has a secret. Everybody seems to have an answer. Mama Cleo, Papa Cleo, Dr. Phil. Everybody has something to say and something to add. What about Christians starting to say, thus says the Lord. This is what God says. I know what the world says. I know what people say. I know what the situation says. I know what the economy, right? I know what they say. I know what the stock market says. I know what you say. I know what Republicans say. I know what Democrats say. I know what blacks, what whites, Hispanics, Asians, everyone. What about what the Lord says? I know what the doctor said, but what about what God says? Amen. I know what the lawyer has been telling us, but what about what God says? I know what my wife, it doesn't matter. What did God say? Am I making sense? What if instead of giving our opinion, we give God's word? What if instead of us thinking, we simply to what God says? This is the problem. A lot of us cannot speak prophetically. Because by the way, prophecy is not this mystic, weird, like, let me read your mail. Tomorrow, you're going to eat something white. <laughs> and you're going to marry someone that will wear something blue. <sighs> like it's on. Like I'm really going to get married and I'm going to eat good tomorrow. Because the prophet said it. Don't get me wrong. There's some people that God will give words of science and words of knowledge. And it's beautiful. And God could do that with anyone, by the way. 
Amen? Now we honor those that are really, genuinely committed to the Lord and can really li listen to the Word of God and discern by the fruit because that's what the Bible says. But did you know that you and I were called to be prophets to our nation? Did you know that you and I are the biggest and the greatest prophets our family will ever hear? Now listen to what I'm saying to you. You are the greatest prophet of your life. Because what the prophet is, is someone who speaks on behalf of God. Someone who knows what God says and repeats it verbatim. Someone who knows what's in the heart of God and says it out loud. Someone with boldness that can say, I know what it feels like, but this is what Jesus says. I know that the land is in starvation, not for physical food, but for the word of God, which is the bread of life. What if I said today, church, that the world doesn't need us to be more relevant. The world needs us to be more prophetic. Simply say the word. I remember being in this hospital with this lady that was connected, tubes everywhere. She was in her last moments. We were called in as pastors to pray for her. My mother used me as a translator. And I remember this being one of the worst translating moments of my entire life. Because my mom had a word from God. And the doctors had a word of science. And my mom said, this woman is not going to die today. I remember translating that like this. Um, eh, this woman may not... I was trying to soften it up, sweeten it up, church it up, sugarcoat it every way I could. I mean, I was buffering everything she would say. My mom said, no, no, papi, tradúceme bien. I, I, I. You know, they don't speak English until you translate wrong, right? <laughs> I know that, man. My mom was sneaky, right? And so I remember because this doctor said she will not make it past today. The they had disconnected her. This woman's last wish was to see her children together. One driving from Utah, the other driving from Arizona. The other one still didn't know if he can come. And my mom said something that I thought was the weirdest thing. I'm like, it's unnecessary. Like, why? Don't do that. He said, this woman will see all her children gathered, and the Lord has the last word, not you. And this tall doctor, I remember he looked so authoritative. I didn't know what to say. I said, I know what she says. <laughs> she says... And this doctor got so red and he looked and said, Senora, lady, you are giving this family false hope. And I didn't want to translate that because I know my mom. My mom's the sweetest lady until you, counteract, until you try to say that the Lord doesn't have power. Or you mess with her children, one of those two. And this lady, man, this lady caught fire. She said, you're only a doctor. I love it. You don't even know. Like, you don't even know. <laughs> if you've ever, if you, I'm not saying doctors are not cool. They're amazing. Be a doctor. <laughs> but he said, but I know the doctor of doctors, the Lord of lords. I was like, she said, she said, well, you're clapping now. But this man said, do whatever you want, but it's on you. He walked out. My mom walked in and continued to pray with the lady. And I was like, oh, Lord, please let her live. At least <laughs> At least to the guy from Arizona, like at least. <laughs> Can I tell you, this lady got up from her bed. She ate a full meal. She lived an entire week and a half, waited for her whole family to come. We were out in the patio of the hospital. She got to pray with them. She got to speak with them. And she died. When she passed, I know because I was there, was a witness with a happy heart, full heart. She got to share the word of God. She got to tell her family, this is all I wanted. Stop fighting amongst each other. Start loving one another. She said, I will see you soon. Give your life to Jesus. Please listen to what I'm saying to you. How do we get the boldness to say, thus says the Lord? From where did this lady say to, you're only a doctor? It's not disrespectful. It's leveling it up, like saying, bro. Who are you to say? See, do we as Christians have the boldness to tell the drug addict 
I know that crystal meth has a hold of you. But my God can break the chains. And tomorrow, you will not know. I just went scuba diving in Mazatlan with this master diver. I was sharing with the family. This guy is awesome. His name is Tiny Toon. That's what we call him now, right? Tiny, that's his, his like, I, I wish, I'll, I'll show a picture of him later, right? I had been scuba diving with him before, but this time was different. This time he knew, and I knew it was, I just, there was something different about him. I know Chris, and Dor Chris was there, Sebas was there, Meli was there, and Elijah was there, right? And this guy had something different. Anyway, we went scuba diving that day. The next day, I went with him again, just him and I. We found a secret place, a beautiful spot, and he began to share his life story with me. He said, I'm going to tell you something. Today is Sunday, and normally I don't take people scuba diving on Sunday. This is the day of the Lord. But I prayed this morning, and the Lord said to me to take you to my secret place, the place where I go with the Lord. We had a beautiful time, this beautiful reef. If I could describe it to you, I should get a raise. It was such an amazing place. I cannot describe it. After that, he began to share with me his testimony. I asked him, you know, um, his tiny tune sounds better than his real name. It's just one of those, those weird names. <laughs> Castulo. I said, Castulo. I told you. Right? So, Castulo, tell me, how did you come to Jesus? And he said, honestly, I had a five and a half year sentence. I was the drug addict that the drug addicts ran away from. The guy that no one wanted. He said, I tried to commit suicide and I couldn't. Not even hell wanted me. And I was like, that's crazy. He looked at me and he said, I was in prison serving five and a half year term. And this guy, this, this Christian that would do church service in there said, would you mind? I would tag, he said, so I would write letters on walls. And he said, would you write some letters on a wall for me? He said, all I have is time, so I'll do it for you. And he began to write a verse that he told them. And in this verse, it said something, that those are free in the Lord are free indeed. And he said that when he finished painting this, he broke down and started crying. And he knew something was changing. He was still a drug addict. So he finished and he showed this guy. And this guy said, can you put another verse? And he said, of course. He had him write a verse and he said, though your mother and father abandon you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said when he finished writing, he wept for an entire week. He couldn't stop crying. He knew that he would never be alone again. 16 years later, drugs have not touched his lips, his body. He is completely a different man. Every rehab center that had kicked him out now calls him, whether it's a Christian rehab center or not, now they want him to come and speak to him. He speaks to 12 rehab centers a week, reaching people for Jesus every single day. From one moment to the next, not a person, just a pen, just, just a brush. And the word of God, thus says the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you have the boldness to tell someone, I know what the doctor said. I know what, it, what, what the economy is pointing towards. I know what you feel. It's, it's hard. Thus says the Lord. But this is what God says. I want to take you to a part of the Bible now a little bit further. That is going to seem so unreal. But it's exactly for us. Because of the season that we're stepping into, because of who you are in Christ, we're going to need it. Amen. It says that Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. God says the Lord, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, right? Tomorrow about this time, see, da, da, da. let's go verse 2. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned, meaning the right hand, answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be like Brother, please. And he said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes. This is what Elisha told him. But you shall not eat of it. Meaning, because you have no faith, don't worry about it. You won't be a part of it. I say, sometimes God would ask you to testify about what's going to happen in your life. But this is not a self-help moment. This is a God help me moment. There's things that you will go through, things that you're going through right now, even emotionally. There was a season in my life where I lost all my friends. I didn't lose all my friends. I walked away from them. Man, I needed some distance because they were dragging me down. If I didn't get some distance, please listen, I would have ended up with them. One of my friends, the blood, ended up shooting somebody, point blank, AK-47. 
but he gave his life to Jesus about six years later in our church. Listen, listen, I needed to get away. And there was a season of solitude. Listen to what I'm saying to you. A season where you have to say, God, please, just you and I. Don't ever mistaken loneliness for solitude. Never mistaken loneliness for So many people, so much information, solitude. Just be alone with God. Have you been alone with God lately? Sometimes we don't know, thus says the Lord, because you haven't been with him. You haven't heard of him. You haven't heard from him. Learn to have solitude with God. Sometimes it's okay to turn everything off and to listen to him. Amen? Amen. Or, oh, man. Amen. Amen. So this is what's going on. This man says, thus says the Lord, this is what's going to happen. The right hand of the king says, nah, it ain't going to happen. And he says, because you don't believe it, don't worry about it. You won't be a part of it. And I would say to us today, if you say, God, I don't think so, don't worry about it because you won't be a part of it either. It's time to start declaring the things that are impossible. Like my family will change. Like my son will come home. Like my daughter will come home. Things that are wild and different. Like our nation will turn back to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Carmen, are you here? Carmen. Carmen Garcia. Yeah, you're right here. Awesome. How long have you been at church for? A very long time. You're one of the people that I've known the longest, really, probably even longer than my wife's family. Back at church, you don't know her story. You may not even know this part, Carmen. As I was praying, I said, Lord, should I share it? And he said, it's okay, so I'm not going to need your permission. <laughs> but your parents came to our church. They were crying. They were broken. Their teenage daughter had run away. She hadn't been around, and they didn't know where she was. They came to a prayer vigil. I remember they were so desperate. You must have been 13 or 14. I don't know the count, but pray 13. I don't know how long you've been away from home. Do you remember how long? A day and a half then? Okay. I thought it was longer, but yeah. Books will stay with that one. There was no communication, and so they came. They were so worried. The cops didn't know what to do. They was too soon, too early, blah, blah, blah. So they came to our church, and I remember... Praying, and we said, you know what? After this prayer vigil, says, thus says the Lord, tomorrow, tomorrow, she will come home. Tomorrow. I remember something happening. As we were praying, and I know because it impacted the whole Perez family. And today, Carmen, you and your family are so beautiful. I know you're sitting by your, your, your whole family. You guys are incredible. A huge blessing to the Lord. You and your husband, man. You and your kids. You guys are awesome. But there was this moment where there was a fight for you, a fight for your life. And the reason I share her story is because there's a teenage daughter somewhere. And I believe that the church and the Christians need to say, thus says the Lord. And give a word of hope and says, the Lord will answer. Carmen, Manuel, do not give up. Don't stop praying. She'll come home tomorrow. We didn't know, but the Lord knew. The boldness to say, your family will be restored. Let me ask you a question. When people come to you in desperation... By the way, she came home, she hasn't left. She's still at home. <laughs> not at home, not at her family, not at her parents' house. She got her own house now and all that. Don't get any ideas, young people. You're like, yeah, see, it happens. <laughs> Failure to launch, it's called. So, not her, she's got her own home. It's beautiful. But it's so amazing to think that one life, and you look at it later, Paola's here, you know, with her husband. I think she's somewhere here also, happily married, lifting weights. You know, uh, over there, uh, man, it's awesome to see you. Give him a round of applause to the whole Pérez family. But when you think about that one story, what if I pointed out your story? What if I asked, what is your story? You know, I think in your story, at some point, somebody had to say, thus says the Lord. 
If you could think back at it, I don't know if it was partying while you were crying drunk and someone says, you know what? I'm in the same boat. But my mom said that the word says, I have a friend and I could tell you so many stories so I'm going to stop. But what about you though? What about you? Are you willing to say, thus says the Lord? Are we willing to say, I know what is happening, I know the condition, but this is what God says. I know that when I call you a prophet, you could think of every reason, Georgie, why you are not, because I would do the same. Because the flesh will tell you, you, as Elijah, to be used by God so a nation can change. I'm telling you right here, right now, thus says the Lord. You and your, you and your family will be saved. You and your family will be saved. Some of you believe this. Some of you are still processing. Thus says the Lord. For you and your whole household will be saved. What if I said to you right here, right now, that God wants to use you as a prophet to the nations? What does that mean? What, is, what does that mean? That God would use you to reach the multitudes. Pastor, I'm already 50. I'm already 60. I'm already 14. What if I said to you, the Lord wants to use you? powerfully that when you speak authority would come forth that when you speak not only chains would break but generational chains will break amen that when you open your heart and your home to the lord that his word would transform that which was impossible to change that sickness can leave at the sound of your voice pastor what are you saying i'm saying thus says the lord the greater things we will do than those that Jesus did while he was on this earth. That's what the Bible says. What if I said to you that fear, fear is evicted from your life. That fear has no grip, no power. Anxiety leaves. That loneliness is a joke to us. Why? Thus says the Lord. Am I making sense? That what if I said to you right here, right now? I mean it. That everything that has happened in your past is the greatest testimony for thousands to give their lives to Jesus do you understand what I'm saying that your weakness is perfected that your that his power is perfected in your weakness that whatever you think you're not able to do anymore the God says I'm just getting started because when the prophet said yeah this economy is going to change and tomorrow we're going to have plenty have you ever had a hard time paying a bill I know none of you guys have been through that moment where you could take from the credit card to pay a bill. And now you're paying interest on the bill you just paid. And you take money from here to cover that hole. And then you dig that hole to try to cover another hole that's a little bigger. So you now have to dig two other holes to, dig this, to cover this one big hole. I know you've never experienced the, the persecution of the friends that call you all the time at the same time. And have to click the red button. Why am I saying this to you? When you have to choose between your phone and your gas. When you have to say, well, do I walk to church? It's a long way. I'm asking you, have you felt, what do you do in those moments? Do you say, well, I guess I won't go. Or do you say, thus says the Lord. Am I making sense? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. What kind of Christian are you? What kind of person are you? What kind of prophet are you? The kind of prophet that sits and cries with everyone else or cries out for everyone else. Are we the kind of people that agree with everything or agree with just one person also just with Jesus, just with the word of God? Do we agree with everyone or everyone that agrees with the Lord? Yeah. That is the difference between a disciple of Jesus and just a churchgoer. What if I asked you today that God is expecting us, he's counting on us. To have his word in our lips. To live out as though he is alive because he is. What if I said to you that you and I have an antidote that the world desperately needs. I love that this story doesn't end like that. Thus says the Lord because thus says the Lord means I've said it. But now you have to walk it. Let's walk a little more. Just a little more. Are you guys okay? Yeah. All right. Second Kings chapter 7 verse 3 now. Now there were four lepers at the entrance of the gate. 
And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Now, if the city is in a bad spot, the lepers are in a worse spot. The lepers don't get the food from the people. Listen, the lepers get the leftovers of the people that have, and they drop off a little extra to them, and that's how they will live, at the expense of other people's kindness. Well, these people are in need, and the lepers are in even worse need. The enemy surrounded the city. The lepers are outside the city. Listen, the lepers are outcasts. They're out of the city. They're not in the mix. What seemed to have been their demise turned into their greatest blessing. They had something that the city didn't have. They had something a little bit different. If you are to follow Christ, at times you will feel like an outcast, a pariah, someone who people, yes, they like, but they'll never let into the inner circle. If you ever felt out of place, praise the Lord, because that might not be where the Lord wants you. Am I making sense? Where you are rejected, it's okay sometimes. Because if you are in the same boat, how could you then come and save the sinking boat later? Am I making sense? I remember being in a place and I try to fit in and I try to do the things they would do. Something inside of me said, this is not your spot. This is not your scene. You can try to talk like them. You can try to sound like them. You can try to look like them. You can try to laugh with them. You're a leper. How in the world, God? You're different. Let me tell you why. Please listen for just a second. These lepers were in such need and desperation. The difference between the lepers and the others is this. That the lepers recognized that they had a problem. They could see it. The people in the city, though, they would blame the Lord. They wouldn't recognize their sin. They would blame the prophet. Wasn't going to use this one, but I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to use it. This part of the, of the sermon goes to you and just for you. The one who gets offended, that's precisely for you. Matter of fact, it's exactly and precisely only for you. I wrote the sermon for you. I'm going to preach just to you who gets offended. For you, the offended person right now. I think you're talking. Yes, I'm talking to you. The one who thinks I'm talking to you. How quickly do we turn on the leadership? How quickly do we turn? Please listen. This man, this king, they looked at Elijah and they tried to blame him. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault that we're in this situation. You see, Elijah had multiplied the bread. I mean, the, the, the oil. He had, he had allowed miracles to happen through his life. Elijah had declared the word of the Lord and the judgment of God against this nation. He wasn't condemning them. He was reminding them of what the Lord said, that they wouldn't be condemned by their sin. So how quickly do we turn on people that try to help us? How quickly do we turn on God when he doesn't abide by our rules? You may not do it directly, if you would have done this, if you would have done that, can I just give you a word of caution? If you recognize, instead of point fingers, your own flaw, even if they have flaws, but if you could change, if you can turn the fingers towards you, I'm telling you this, you're that much closer to abundance in Christ. But when you're pointing at everyone else and everyone else's fault, you may think it's going to get you satisfaction. You may think they're going to say, you're so right. I can't believe how right you've been. I talked to someone this week that said, I'm tired. I'm tired of always being the one that has to change. I've heard that before. I've said it before too. Listen, this is so beautiful. These lepers are like, well, we're lepers. What are we going to do? They begin to speak in such a wise way. Listen to them, okay? Listen. I love this part of the Bible. It says, why are we here sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the family, the, the family, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall only die. Okay, listen. If they keep us alive, then we shall live. What wise words, right? And if they kill us, we're only going to die. What wise words? <laughs> These people understood. We're doomed. Regardless, it's over. So we might as well try something. Desperation will lead you to do something. Sometimes in your family, as you look at them, you just got to get desperate and try something. When your friend you know is living a life that is destroying him, 
Sometimes you just got to say, hey, if he gets offended, he gets offended. But I'm going to try something. If he thinks I'm weird, eh, he's only going to think I'm weird. Let's just try something. The problem is that we're too alive in ourselves. We think that our lives are better off. But if you just realize this, that God, God, has taken your life. And if you really are dead to sin and alive in Christ, he can use you. He could use me so much more. These people said, you know what? Our only hope is to do something. Listen to this, okay? A little bit more. Are you guys okay? Yeah. I know the heat is getting to you, but this is not that hot. I mean, up here is hotter, but this is not that hot. You guys okay? Yeah. All right, cool, cool. Five, and they, arose, and they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, my iPad died, so that's my sign. But I know the rest of the story, so don't worry about it. So they came and they arose at twilight. They arose really early. And as they said, you know what, we're going to go into the enemy camp. We're not going to go into the city. They won't let us in. There's no food in there anyway. We're going to go to the enemy, and if they kill us, they kill us. If not, at least they'll feed us. So when they go there, the Lord does a miracle. He has this sound, this tremendous sound, not coming from the lepers, but coming from the action of those that are desperate. Coming from a moment of grace where God can say, listen, these people, the enemy gets so freaked out. They hear the armies of the living God. They completely abandon everything, their food, their wealth, their spoils, everything they had brought for the siege. For years, months, I don't know how long, they bone out. They take off. They freak out. They leave on a hurry, leaving everything behind. These four lepers step into this place full of fear, but with some action, some desire. As they step into this place, they see all the food, all the spoils, and they go nuts. You ever thought about this? What would I do if I win the lottery? You guys ever sat and wondered, like us poor folk? No? Like... What if I got a hundred, you see the, you know, see the red numbers? Ah, that one's okay. Okay, the big one, the big one. 168 million. What would I do? Of course, I would give my tithe first. Then I would buy my mom a house. What would you do if all of a sudden, phew, you just ball, like everything just happens? What would you do if out of nowhere, the Lord just blesses you in such an incredible way? I know most of us here would say, I would just begin to bless people. I begin to do something great. And maybe you would. This is what happened. The lepers began to pig out. They're like, they began to stuff themselves. They, I think they began to put all the different clothing. They began to, hey, check this one out. Look, how does it fit? And one was like missing an arm. You know, it's like, ah, it looks weird on you. You know, what about you? And they began to try all the different jewelry. They were looking like Mr. T, if you guys know who that is. You know, like, <laughs> Flavor Flav. You know, they were like, 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 these guys were just trying everything. Everything. Wouldn't you, though? Wouldn't you try everything, eat everything? Just like, I've never had this. The Lord has definitely blessed me. And they were so excited, so happy. One of them said something that the church needs to hear today. What we are doing here today is not a good thing. Let's read it up here. It says, you have it up there? You guys have it up there, yeah? Okay. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight. Uh, a little further up. And drank, uh, uh, back. Thank you. and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went out and hid them. Yeah, they weren't dumb. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there and also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, listen, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. Do you know that the word gospel means good news? Like when you share the gospel with someone, it doesn't mean you tell them in Greek and Hebrew what the Bible says. It's just good news. I don't know everything. I just have good news for you. The good news of salvation. Today is a good news day. They said to each other, this is a day of good news. And we remain silent? If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. I love this. That these lepers had so much more common sense than so many Christians. 
We have salvation. We have the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the purpose of God, the promises of God. And we look at a world that's hurting without Christ. This is not me judging you. This is me telling us, church, it's time. This is the day of good news. This is the day where we tell the world that's filled with anxiety, whether they're good looking, not so good looking, tall, short, whether they are rich or poor or anywhere in between, whether they speak your language or not, trust me, everyone needs to hear the love of God. Am I making sense? Whether they're far or near, whether you think they will listen or not, today is the day of good news. Today is the day of the gospel. To be able to say, God, use me because I want to do something with what you have given to me. I have abundant life. You know what abundant means? Flowing and overflowing. I have you, Jesus. I don't ever, ever, if you ever feel alone, it's because you have decided to hear your emotions over his words. But you will never be alone again, ever. I mean, ever, ever. You will never walk in defeat. Death has lost its power over your life. Do you hear what I said? That death, the ultimate evil to the world, seemingly to us, it's a promotion. To go with my dad, the one that I love the most, my father in heaven who's taking care of me. When my earthly father passed, my heavenly father continued to provide and walk and protect and care for. Am I making sense? The one who loves you so much that gave his one and only son. If you believe in him, you have everlasting life. What if I said to you that in the greatest moment of desperation of the United States of America, where people became dependent on themselves and on a government and on a structure, and they saw how weak it can be, they're looking around and saying, Who has bread? Who has bread? And I love that the Bible chose four lepers, Georgie. Four lepers. That he didn't choose like, you know, a major prophet. He didn't choose David or, you know, some guy with attitude, you know, or some guy with training. He chose four broken people. You know what sin represents in the Bible? Sin. He chose four sinful people. People that weren't all together, no pun intended. People that had so much need, rejected people. You know, I remember something I heard in Mexico City as I went to this one training for missionaries. God uses not the able, but the available. That God uses not the ones who have skills, but the ones who have desire. That God is not looking for perfection. God is looking for you. He's looking for me. He's not looking everywhere else. He's looking at his church, at his children and saying, who will go before us? Who will go? And until one leper like you and I will say, here I am, God, send me. I have something to offer. I have you. I have the bread of life. I have water that quenches real thirst. Am I making sense? I have something that the world desperately needs. God, I want to go. And if I die, I die. And if I die, I die. Am I making sense? And if I go, I go. They didn't know how they were going to receive them. They didn't know if they were going to mock them. All they knew is that they had something to offer. Did you know that when you know you have something to offer, you can never be small? Listen to what I'm saying. Sometimes we, we think that we need to be prideful and, and have this, this thing about us because we've gone to school. Or because we've made something of ourselves. My God, listen, please. You have something to offer that the world desperately needs. You and I have something to offer that even the richest man in the world would kill for. I know that. I've been to companies. I've been to places. I've talked to people, famous people. And I'm telling you, they the same as you and I and your friend. They have something that they need. His name is Jesus. They need Jesus. You should never feel small. You should never, ever, ever, ever in the world feel small. Moses would stutter when he'd speak to the m -m 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 Moses but when he spoke on behalf of God my God the clouds would listen the seas would open you have to understand what I'm trying to tell you when you speak to someone don't speak out of your Mexicanness or your whiteness or your blackness or your youth 
or your experience speak out of the abundance of the life that God has put in you am I making sense like when we talk when we talk I remember very clearly like people really try to impress and really try to show something what if you show Jesus like what if we instead of trying to appear interesting to people we just try to appear like Christ to them am I making sense what if instead of trying to get something from someone you know you have something in you and you can't wait to share it not just with words but with actions come and feed come and give come and bear the burdens with someone else one person left this church so angry and upset because he wouldn't get any recognition and I said to you do you know why you don't get any recognition because you don't help anyone you don't do anything for anyone why would anyone remember you've never been there in their time of need you never cared about them all you will have done is ask and my God has given to you enough and he will continue to give you and that's the thing that I could not I remember very clearly what he said to me I thought this was a church and I understand now, as I understand this word people think that because they see a fortified city there's no need there's so much need in here too we need to feed each other we need to bless one another we have words of faith and encouragement to one another I know that there's need guys I know that this world desperately needs it what if today we ask God something would you please stand up with me these people man these four lepers impress me man I, I, I don't know them when I get to heaven I'm gonna be like what's up leper Larry you know and I'm gonna ask him I'm gonna ask him of the faces I think that when they went and they knocked they knock on the city wall, right? This big old wall. I love it. I, I could see it in my mind. At first, they wouldn't open. But they kept on knocking and knocking. And finally, this thing, big doors begin to open. And you have these four lepers and people are like, oh, and they get away from them. What? Get away. We have no room for you. We don't need you. And they go, really? Ah! And they bust out this big old loaf of bread or oh, a piece of chicken. You know what I'm saying? Like they bust out the goods. And they're like, come on in, we need you. And they say to them, there is blessings outside of your city. Outside of the walls that you're in, there's so much more. The enemy has been defeated. The enemy has been defeated. And the Lord has blessed us the Bible says that there was this huge stampede people began to trample just push around like Black Friday at Walmart like everything was just wow the doors were being busted open and this guy the right hand of the king the one that didn't believe the Bible says that he tried to stop people from the blessing and you know what happened the Bible says that he got trampled he got stumped on and he died and the word of the Lord came to pass where Elisha said to him, because you did not believe, you will not eat of it. And today I challenge us, church, to believe that God could change anyone, that God can transform any situation, that God could heal any disease, that God can provide for any need, that God can lift up anyone who's fallen, that God, no matter if it's Castulo, a, a drug addict for years, and can turn him into a soul winner, Am I making sense? Or you've been single and super single and that's extra duper super single? And the Lord would say tomorrow, don't worry, you didn't believe it? It's not for you then. Am I making sense? What if we start confessing things that are not as though they were like in Ephesians chapter 11 verse 1? What if we start speaking with words of faith? What if instead of agreeing with everything, we start saying, God, but I know you're still alive. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to lift up our hands. And we're going to ask God to show us the need of our nation, of our friends, of our family. God's going to put someone in your mind right now, in your heart. Just like Carmen and her family came to church a long time ago, a 13-year-old lost. And now her and her own kids are in church today. I know, I know that there's been struggles in all of our lives. But my God, thank you for your word. Thank you for prayer warriors. Thank you for people that believe when we couldn't believe. God, thank you so much for parents that pray for us, for grandmas that do not stop praying. Thank you, God, for leaders, cell leaders that are so imperfect, but they pray for us and they love us and they care and they feed us weekly. God, thank you so much for pastors. Thank you for those people that now, today, as imperfect as they are, they have faith for us. 
Thank you, God, for friends. Thank you for this church, the hospital where people go to be healed. Thank you, God, because in the midst of lepers, we have hope, we have bread, we have so much to offer to the world. God, I ask you right now that everyone that is here with their hands raised, that they would begin to speak in faith in the midst of trouble. God, that they will not be fair with our Christians, that we will be disciples in the dark and in the night and in the day, God. That we will be disciples whether it rains or shines, that we will be the same Bible-believing, confessing Christians in the midst of it all. God, that our politics reflect your word, that our hearts reflect your word, that our emotions reflect your word. God, that our relationships reflect your love. God, forgive us if we have decided to agree with someone other than you first. God, help us, Lord. Help us, God. Please give us wisdom. Why don't you begin to ask God to use you right where you are? I feel like God's going to answer someone today. God's going to answer someone as you begin to ask God to use you to change a nation, to change your family, to change your surrounding, your city, your company, to change, to change. Begin to confess things that were not as they were. Begin to confess that maybe, just maybe for some of you, someone needs to come home. A verdict from a judge needs to be on your way now. Maybe, just maybe, just like the people that were in need and God was already winning their battle without them knowing God is already winning your battles as well God is preparing a feast for you but you need to confess you need to say thus says the Lord and speak to the storm speak to the storm speak to the storm just like Jesus did in the name of Jesus we declare God that you stand above our problems you stand above it all use this church use us God to win the lost God, use us, God, to win those that no one dares to speak to. Use us, God, to win those that have a hard time recognizing even who they are. God, I pray right now that our hearts would be so open, so broad, so wide, that judgment would dissipate from this church. God, that we would have hope for anyone and everyone and everyone that comes before them and after them. God, give us words of faith. Why don't you as the prophet say with me God forgive us if in our lips we have had anything other than your word forgive us God if we have confessed things that are not according to your heart God help us to speak your truth and your word help us God to be people of the word to prophesy over our families to speak now I'm gonna take one more minute I'm gonna ask you to do something right with your eyes closed if there's any one of you here that has been living under circumstance and not under the shadow of the Almighty, my God, there's someone here that I know you're strong. You, you are strong. You, you had to become strong. Over the years, you had to be callous and, and, and fend for yourself. And the Lord would say to you now, you've never been alone. I've always been with you. It's time to stop doing things on your own. It's time to fall on my arms and to walk with me. The Lord would say to you now, I love you and I loved you even when you were sinning, when you were in trouble. I loved you then, I took care of you. I have a plan for you, I have a purpose for you. My God has been looking for you. He loves you so much. He's been waiting for you. All this time, He prepared today for you. He says, you have come to my house, now sit at the table and eat the bread of life. His name is Jesus. He offers salvation. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to say to God, I'm not perfect, I have a long way to go, but I know that I need you. I don't want to blame everyone else. I recognize my sin and I ask you to change me. Why don't you tell God this word, tell him, Jesus Christ, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Will you transform me, God? Change me, Jesus. Make me the person that you created me to be. I want to walk with you. And I want to work with you, God. I want to love you. I want to learn to love you more. Jesus, thank you for dying in the cross. And paying the price of my sin. Thank you for paying the price that I could never pay. You died in my place. And I receive your gift of salvation. Jesus, thank you. Today I can say, I love you.
because you love me first. In your name we pray.